Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back once again to the Tech Blog Rider podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here and have me talking directly into your earballs, no matter where you're listening in the world. And I mean that in a nice way, not a sinister way. But today, I am in a reflective mood, thinking a little bit about my IT past. For those of you that don't know, for any business to accept credit cards, they need to be PCI compliant, which pretty much means jumping through a whole heap of hoops and proving that you don't write down people's credit card numbers on pieces of paper and put them in a drawer somewhere. A lot of those requirements can be quite complex. As a result of that, many businesses simply choose to skip that responsibility of storing someone's live credit card data by using a third-party solution such as PayPal, Square or Stripe. After all, these guys are more secure and more knowledgeable in this area than you could ever be, right? So let somebody else deal with that problem. But the payments industry has been under attack recently, and a recent survey revealed that a mass majority, 84% of payment industry professionals, believe that payment fraud is only going to get worse, and much sooner than most people realise. So are those businesses using payment processes still opening themselves up to a security risk? After reading about this whole range of high-profile hacks, I wanted to find out more about that whole landscape and what it means, what the threats are, and what businesses can do to protect themselves from it. But let's keep this a spoiler-free zone. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to San Francisco so we can speak with Matthew Gast from a company called T-Cell. So, massive warm welcome to the show, Matthew. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Well, I'm really glad to be here. Right now, I am in the security space. I work as a product manager for a company called T-Cell, which was recently acquired by Rapid7. We make a production application security system. So if you have apps that you expose to the fury of the internet, we help you protect them. And I do that because on weekends, I like to get high. And although I am from California, we did just legalize marijuana. That's actually not what I'm referring to. I am a pilot for fun. I'm glad you brought that up because I read a great tweet from you the other day that said, when I first interviewed in Silicon Valley, I flew into San Jose Airport. But on Tuesday, I landed there again. But this time I was at the controls, which is incredibly cool. I mean, you unlocked some pretty cool man points with that tweet. But can you tell (laughs) me a little bit more about your love of flying and the story behind it? Because to actually get to the controls of a plane like that, there's a lot of hours involved, isn't there? Uh, There can be. And first, I think I have to say, for uh, to give credit where credit is due, the photo with that tweet was actually taken by my flight instructor who was sitting in the right seat at the time. I have loved aircraft ever since I was a kid. At one point, my parents thought I might have been bound for the Air Force to learn to fly there and to fly high-performance stuff. As it Turns out I had tremendous ear trouble on airplanes when I was a kid, so I had to set that aside. And in fact, I chose to go to a college after high school, which didn't require me to fly, which is very funny if you know anything about my career. For a while, I was involved in standards work for Wi-Fi technology. I chaired a few task groups, and that would not have been possible without flying about 120,000 miles a year. So at some point, I decided that if flying 120,000 miles a year on commercial airlines couldn't ruin my love affair with aviation, it was time to learn to fly. So I took my first flight. It was actually a gift from a coworker who had bought a Groupon and could not use it. She had bought it for her husband and said, here you go. Merry Christmas. I can't use this for, for Chris. Never say I don't do anything for you. So I I took my first flight on December 17th of 2011, which coincidentally turns out to be an anniversary of the Wright brothers' first flight way back in 1904. Several years later, I took my flight instructor test. So I teach people to fly gliders. And right now I am working on becoming an instructor in airplanes. Part of what I was doing with that tweet was I had flown with an instructor down to Santa Barbara for dinner. 
there's a requirement to do a flight with an instructor of at least 100 miles where you do it at day and then at night. So we chose to go to Santa Barbara for dinner because we could fly down there in the afternoon, have dinner, and then fly back at night. And on the way back, my instructor said, you know what? Why don't we try landing at San Jose? So you ask the controller nicely, any chance of a touch and go at San Jose? They handed me over to the tower. The tower was very willing to work with me, asked for a touch and go. They cleared me on the runway. So this gigantic runway, because it handles jets as opposed to a four seat Piper Archer, the wheels touched down, I hit the throttle and we kept going and I got a landing at San Jose International in my logbook. Afterwards, I realized that that was the airport I flew into when I had my first interview for the, the job that would eventually, that, that would took me to Silicon Valley after college. Wow, what a cool story. Uh, quite poetic as well that you've kind of come full circle though. But Santa Barbara for dinner and a touch and go at San Jose, that, that's rock and roll right there, isn't it? <laughs> well, and it also happens that uh, it was my birthday, so I thank the controller for making it very memorable too. Excellent. Now, I could talk to you about flying and your adventures for hours. I mean, I think that's another podcast episode on its own. But one of the main reasons I invited you on the show today was to talk about the recent spite of uh, online car breaches. And for anyone that somehow missed this, can you just set the scene on and expand on what it was and how many companies have been affected recently? Well, there are companies that we know about and there are companies that we don't. The basic attack is you've heard about credit card skimmers. You put a payment card into a machine and somebody has put a magnetic stripe reader on it that captures the information and then they have your credit card information. If they ask you for a PIN or the validation number or a zip code, they capture that too by basically putting something, it's called a skimmer, and they capture your information as you use your card to pay. Well, turns out you can do this online too. The two most famous breaches recently were over on your side of the pond at British Airways, and then um, an electronics company called Newegg, which I've ordered from quite a lot over the years because they have excellent prices and service. Um, Before that, there was a similar but not identical attack against Ticketmaster. And this appears to be one of the new ways that breaches are happening, in part because we've applied a lot of security to various online businesses in the way that you, you buy stuff that when you can't go into a database and say, show me all of the credit card numbers a customer has used because you're no longer allowed to store those, well, Attackers find another way because there is a tremendous opportunity for monetary gain here. And so in one sense, these are becoming subtle attacks that are quite devious, but they're doing that because it shows that we've done a reasonably good job securing all of the basic attacks that made headlines 20 years ago. Well, just for anyone listening, I mean, here in the UK, any company that wants to accept card payments will have to reach PCI compliance. But smaller companies that process online payments very often now are enlisting the help of payment processors like Stripe, Square or PayPal to help them meet those stringent compliance standards and take away a lot of the hassle. But do you think these recent headlines suggest that even they can't actually prevent a data breach? And if anything, are they actually opening themselves up even more? These payment processors serve a valuable role because PCI compliance can be a challenge. It used to be you had to do the whole thing yourself. What's happened now with the ability to outsource a lot of your payment infrastructure is that you can depend on Stripe or PayPal or Square to do the work of being PCI compliant, highly security aware. They can divide the cost of an expensive and competent security team among all of their customers, and they can aggregate that, and that helps smaller businesses save a bundle on PCI compliance, because for the most part, you can say, I'm accepting online payments, but I use one of these companies that has done all of the work, here's their paperwork, and that's great. That's a great way to pass a PCI audit, and that's why these companies are so big and in and have grown so rapidly. The challenge is that PCI was written 
originally in a world where you owned all the infrastructure so that it would be your website hosted on your servers in your data center with code written completely by your developers. And if I sound like I'm from a podcast interview that would have been from many years ago, there's a reason for that. Because today, the way we build applications is we outsource as much as we can. We bring in experts to help us do things that are otherwise onerous. So for payments, we hire a payment processor. We run our applications on various cloud services, whether that's virtual machines or platform as a service or containers, and we outsource that infrastructure too. So we don't own our data center. We build our applications using a variety of open source code. We build a website that is compelling by bringing together these things all in one place and so that you become almost an integrator for the payment application that you're writing. And that's where the challenge comes in is that PCI was originally written in a world where you had a lot more control and the combination of things wasn't as big a challenge. That if you think about, say, uh, taking prescriptions, your pharmacist plays a critical role in watching for drug interactions, and that's where they're often first observed, that PCI doesn't have this concept yet. The reason why Ticketmaster was breached was they wanted to have a chat script. So you go to a website and you say, I'd like to buy some tickets. Well, that's cool. I need some help doing this because I'm not familiar with what's going on. And there's a little window in the bottom that says, can I help you with anything? And why would on earth would you write your own chat system? There's no reason to do it. In fact, at T-Cell, when we decided that we wanted to have a website chat system, we turned it on from another provider. We didn't write it because that would be silly. There are several things that you can just buy. Likewise, why would you build your own payment infrastructure? There are companies which have spent years making that secure and reliable and scalable. So the challenge is that this all comes together in a web browser. And when you think about it, a web browser is a pretty amazing piece of software. You're able to access content from computers you don't really know, from many computers you don't know at the same time, and it's all sandboxed in a way that there's a level of trust on both sides, that I trust that I can go fetch stuff I can identify by name, but not necessarily with the ability to look and scan everything before it hits my browser. And this is something you do all the time. Because all of this comes together in the browser, it's those interactions that are really important. A lot of modern applications now are built on having JavaScript in the browser. This is how you can go to a browser and you can have something be almost interactive. I remember the first time I saw Google Maps, which was one of the pioneering Ajax applications, and it was amazing to go to a browser, drag this map around, and have it respond almost as if it was a program running on my computer. To do that, the web browser has to have all of these scripts that come in and react. Now, they may be reacting to what I'm typing in. They might be reacting to my input, so they see me scrolling. They might be preloading some stuff. So in the case of a map, they might pull tiles that are off screen then that might be dragged back onto the screen. Well, the thing is, the browser sandbox doesn't protect scripts from each other. Any script you load can access anything on the page. And there is the security vulnerability that's been exploited in these attacks. Any script on the page can read anything on the page. So if you build a web page that has a highly secure frame from your payment processor that says, please give me your credit card number, powered by very secure payment processor, any script on the page from anywhere else can access that. And you've typed your credit card number in, you've put in the information, that frame of the page is absolutely secure, but something else on the page can still read it. So if payment fraud is really going to get worse and the digital landscape is completely changing now and PCI compliance is in some ways looking a little bit lost with this new way of doing it. How do businesses stop opening themselves up to security risks and protect their business greater? Well, one is that 
PCI is likely going to have to come out with a revision that addresses this problem and looks at the way that applications are now built. And they've taken steps to that, that the early vision, the early revisions of PCI didn't talk about outsourcing and assurance, and now they do. The key here is that you can have a skimmer script that runs in your browser. I load this, this script, it looks for payment information, it grabs the payment information. Well, that's all fine and good, but what you can do is you can prevent it from being reported. One of the, the challenges in launching an attack like this is the skimmer script is not terrifically difficult to write. You can go to any company's website, you can go through their checkout process, you can see how they set up the cart and where you enter information that they want to grab. Typically, what most websites do for security is that they have something called the same origin policy. Basically, I can interact with anything that this page loaded from. So if you're going to say Google, you only look at Google services. You don't have anything else going on on the page. Well, that again made sense when most web applications were developed entirely monolithically so that I would write an application and I knew everything that was going on. Well, now if you're a publisher, you run an ad service because you're trying to make money off it. If you uh, use anything else, you're pulling in content from potentially multiple providers and you're doing this mixing thing where you're basically making up a new application. You're building it from components. It's just that where it used to be, say, libraries, now it's other websites. And so you have to be able to access all these websites at the same time. Because there's a potential risk here, there is something defined in HTTP called the content security policy. I'm gonna be talking about this probably a fair amount. So when you hear me say CSP, that's what I'm referring to. It's basically a header that says, here's what you're allowed to connect to. So it's almost like a firewall that your application gives to the browser and says, here's what you're allowed to connect to, don't connect to anything else. So that I can say, all right, well, I know that my application uses content, of course, from my site. Um, I've got an ad network in there. I have a marketing automation system in there. And that's it, you're not allowed to use anything else. Well, the challenge in doing this is that you don't always know what is going on with your application. That it may be you change ad providers because you feel like you're going to get a better deal from another ad network. Well, in that case, you have to change the CSP to match. It may be that you add a new function that requires you to interact with some other site, that you change your payment provider or you add a, a chat script to your web page. All of these things are changes that would cause your CSP to need to change. And that's one of the reasons why this has been, uh, this hasn't been adopted as much as would otherwise help. This is absolutely a defense against this kind of attack because you have the skimmer script, it finds something on the page, finds it from another piece of the page, and then it reports it. You can use a CSP to prevent the skimmer script from having a report be transmitted anywhere. In which case, yes, you have this vulnerability because scripts can read anything on the page, but you can prevent scripts from reporting to anywhere that's not in the content security policy. Now, I think this is the perfect opportunity to now introduce T-Cell, which is obviously where you work. So can you tell me a little bit more about what problems you solve with T-Cell and also what makes what you guys do a little bit unique from all the other solutions out there? One of the problems in using content security policies is that you have to manage them. And the spec itself is pretty straightforward. You supply a header that says you're allowed to connect to these sites for this type of content. So you can get images from here, you can get scripts from this other site. And then when you do something that's not allowed by the content security policies, a violation report is sent. So the challenge in using content security policies is that when you change the application, you need to change the policy as well. CSPs can be run in 
one of two modes. You can either run in a reporting mode where every time the browser takes an action that would be forbidden, you send a report called a violation and it might say something like, this application tried to connect to imstealingyourstuff.com. The second mode is where you actually block anything that's not allowed in the policy. And the reason for these two modes is typically you'll need to run in the first mode for a little bit to understand where your application is connecting so that you can then lock down the policy to what you want. The spec is pretty clear about how you do all this. You can set a policy that allows certain things. You can then collect reports and you specify the URL at which reports are collected. The challenge is that there aren't very many ways to make sense of all of this data. And one of the things that we did at T-Cell, because these attacks come and hit you in the browser, is that providing security in the browser is important. It's where things like cross-site scripting happen. It's where attacks like this mage cart breach take effect. And therefore, the best place to defend them is in the browser. And in the case of attacks that depend on grabbing some data and then sending it elsewhere, the best way to prevent that attack is to prevent the data from being sent. And if you read about the attacks against British Airways and Newegg, there was a time sequence in these that first the attackers seemed to notice a vulnerability and then they introduced that vulnerability, but not right away. First thing they did was to actually set up a place to receive all of the skimmed data. Now they wanted it to look like it belonged because if you analyze an application, you'll see all the connection it, it makes, but how do you hide this? And that's one of the somewhat subtle things they did is that they noticed that British Airways was vulnerable. And they said, all right, well, we're going to attack British Airways. We've got to receive data, but we need to hide. So they registered the domain baways.com. It could be British Airways. It's close enough to hide. At Newegg, they registered newegstats.com. Well, if you're a security ad administrator at Newegg, you're looking at these reports, you see a bunch of connections to Newegg, you see some to your shopping cart provider, and you see newegstats.com. Well, that's not obviously wrong. It looks like it could be something you've done. After all, there are companies that will register other domains in order to host different pieces of their infrastructure. So it's not unheard of. If you're trying to hide, the best way to hide is in plain sight. How do you know whether something is good or not? Well, you can go talk to a development team and say, hey, did you just register this new domain to receive this information? Well, there are people on your development team who know about that, but you have to find the right person. And these are large companies with very sophisticated division of labor because they're getting a lot done. It takes a lot to run an airline. And even if you just say it takes a lot to allow people to buy airline tickets, that's also a true statement. There's a huge development team at British Airways devoted to collecting payment information and allowing people to buy tickets. So had they registered a new domain, there would be somebody who knows, but are you going to be able to access that person easily? Security teams and development teams don't always get along, and the bigger the teams, the harder it is to get to the answer that you need. The answer may be in the code, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to find the person who wrote the code who can give you a definitive answer. So what we have done at T-Cell is to make sense of these CSP reports, we've added a couple of things. So you can absolutely see what's going on. You would see traffic to BA Ways or Newegg stats, and these then get classified with a variety of data feeds to come up with a reputation score. And that is one of the keys to addressing this. Because when you register a new domain, typically one of the things you'll do, especially if you're receiving information securely, is that you'll get a certificate to encrypt those connections. And there are multiple levels of validation for certificates. The most basic one is domain validation, where the registrar basically says, 
do you control this domain? Prove that you control it either by receiving an email or putting this tag on a page that we can go access. It tells you that, yes, the certificate was issued to somebody who controls the domain, but that's a pretty low bar. It doesn't mean that the domain has anything to do with what they say it does or what the domain might imply. And that's one of the reasons for having extended validation certificates. You'll see this in your browser when you get a different lock or you might get a green banner that lets you know an extended validation certificate is in use. And this is one where the registrar actually says, well, where do you do business? Let's see corporate letterhead. Let's see information that backs this up. And if you look at it, the way that Magecart received reports of all these the skim data, they were using newly registered domains, which is suspicious. They were using domain validated certificates, which is also a little bit suspicious. These aren't bad things, but they do mean that you should be more wary. And these are all signals that can be used to say, you know what, this is not a completely trustworthy site. We're pretty sure we know what all the major ad networks are. We know when you're using Google Ads, that's a really well-established business. But NewEggStats.com, it was registered a couple of weeks ago. We connect to it, we get back a domain validated certificate. Um, this is something which you should investigate. And so therefore, rather than just look at the name and say, oh yeah, well that could be us because that looks like something that we might have registered. It's got our company name in it. All of these signals are used to produce something that draws your attention to it and would cause you to look a little bit farther. And then you can say, well, I'm being attacked because on investigation, this is a newly registered domain. It's pretty easy to tell that we didn't do it. Now it's obvious that it's an attack. And one of the reasons why it's so valuable to discover that rapidly is you look at the language of these breach reports. And they were in terms of the number of people affected, but it was lots of people between this date and this date. And that's because under PCI, you're not able to store credit card information anymore. So this attack was not, hey, I got into the systems and I found the database that has all the credit card information and I have a copy of it, so I've got everybody. It was in real time as people are making transactions on this website, I'm receiving reports of all of the personal information and the payment card information. And that's why it's unclear who's affected because you don't know if a database has been stolen. What you know is that potentially everybody who bought something on the site between the day in which the attack was successfully started and the day that it was discovered is potentially a victim. Now, from what we've covered so far, though, without wanting to send people into panic mode, these things are not just a theoretical attack anymore. So are you finding that boardrooms and business leaders are getting that now? Absolutely. What we're seeing is that security is an important risk control for the organization and that there is, of course, the risk of being in uh, the of being attacked this leads to a possible reputation risk and it might might lead customers to go to a different site and with so much business being transacted through public facing applications and with the ability to build applications that interact with partners that risk is then dependent on everybody else's risk. You have suppliers and, and their risks also affect you. In the case of, say, Ticketmaster, they were breached because one of their suppliers was. And so in that case, what's really interesting about that is that the breach happened because a website component was breached and then that could affect potentially all of their that component supplier's customers so you're able to put in a credit card skimmer without breaching the sites that collect money directly. So how do you defend against flaws that might be in components you use to move your application to market faster? And absolutely, this is a high-level conversation. Chief information security officers increasingly 
have a seat at the table where this risk is being discussed. And we sometimes joke at T-Cell that really the reason we started the business was to make sure that when your company appeared in the Times, it would be for good reasons, not because of anything that you were required to disclose under law. So what's next for T-Cell? I mean, is there anything else you could share with us about what you guys are doing and the difference you're going to be making over the next 12 to 18 months? Well, the most exciting thing that happened is that we were acquired by Rapid7, which is a vendor of security tools. And one of the things that is unique about Rapid7's approach is that they have really built their security tools into an integrated platform. And so we're really looking forward to how we would use real-time application security information to uh, both benefit from and enhance all the other offerings that Rapid7 has. Fantastic. What a huge thank you for coming on the show today. But before I do let you rush off, can I just ask that you remind the listeners of where they can find you guys online? Maybe contact a member of your team if we've got any questions after our conversation today and just find out any information about any of the topics that we've discussed. Absolutely. Our website is at www.tcell.io. For information about the details of the Magecart attacks that we discussed, You can read about those on our blog. I've written several posts about it. Contact information for us is available through the website, and we are completely happy to hear from you at any time. What a huge thank you for coming on today. There's so many big talking points, and I feel like we've covered a lot of ground today and something that's going to resonate with a lot of business leaders. And, of course, if you're ever having a touch-and-go over to Birmingham here in the UK, which is a pretty long way to come for a touch-and-go, I'll have a nice cup of tea waiting for you. But more than anything, just a big thank you for coming on today, Matthew. Well, you're welcome. And if I ever get to Birmingham again, I will be sure to look you up. So much of what we talked about today really hammered home to me that this is no longer just a theoretical attack. Approaches like we've mentioned have already been used on Magento e-commerce customers and British Airways hack recently also used that same approach as well. So I'm grateful for Matthew coming on and joining us today and hearing how T-Cell are helping advise companies on what they can do to protect their customers visiting their website or application from XSS. So, but over to you. Do you have any experience about any of the topics we discussed today? Or do you just have a question like, Neil, what would you like for Christmas so I can buy you a nice gift? Can't blame a guy for trying, right? <laughs> but seriously, whatever it is, email me, techblogwriter at outlook.com, tweet me at Neil C. Hughes, pop by my website, techblogwriter.co.uk slash podcasts if you want to find out more about today's guest and indeed listen to any of the podcasts. So thanks so much for dropping by and choosing to spend a few minutes with me and invite me along to join you on your daily routine. I do appreciate it more than you'll ever know. So a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.